Welcome to the 2022 Candidates Forum, sponsored by the Wallingford Community Women in conjunction with Wallingford Government Media. I'm Kathy Shavey, the program moderator. This segment features the candidates running for Senate District 34. The format will be as follows. The first part of the program will consist of questions asked of the candidates by two reporters from the Record Journal. They are Jessica Sims, Wallingford reporter, and Crystal Eliscana, reporter for the Latino Communities Reporting Lab. The second part will allow each candidate to make a closing statement. During the question and answer portion of the program, each candidate will have two minutes to respond to a question. The opposing candidate will be allowed one minute for rebuttal. To conclude the program, each candidate will have three minutes to make closing remarks. Prior to the program, a flip of a coin determined the order of questioning. Before beginning the questioning, I'd like to introduce the candidates running for Senate District 34. David Bedell, Green Party. Paul Ciccarella, Republican. Ms. Sims, will you ask the first question of Mr. Ciccarella? What would you do to address the recent rise in homelessness in Connecticut? So homelessness is not just a problem in Connecticut. And it's something that we pay a lot of attention to. Um, my time on the Housing Committee um, is very insightful to the issues that we have with the shortage of housing. And you know, that, that's a, a really big question for two minutes. And I'm going to try to do as, as much as I can to, to shed some light on some solutions that I think that we can do at the Capitol here in Connecticut, because this is a national issue. But here in Connecticut, what we can do to try to, to alleviate some of that burden. Housing is outrageously expensive. I don't care what part of Connecticut you live in. It could be to purchase, to rent. Part of that problem is simply the cost of doing business. Um, if somebody needs to buy a piece of land and develop it into um, housing, it used to take about six months to a year to buy a large piece of property and then develop it. Now, something like that could take six years. And in that six years, the developer would have purchased the property, let's say a million dollars and they have to borrow money. So instead of paying interest on that million dollars for six months to a year, it's now taking six years. And that interest is going to be paid by somebody, which is ultimately the end user. Okay. Now, you're gonna need attorneys, that's expensive, to get through some of the red tape. In short, what we need to do is find a creative way for affordable housing, and in the 30 seconds I have left, I think it's gonna be find creative ways to cut the red tape and the challenges builders have every day, every single day they have these challenges that stop them from getting the job done. And we need to determine what those are and accommodate their needs without challenging them every step of the way. And that will reduce the cost of building Thank you. and will trickle down. Mr. Bedell? Yes, I think uh, the problem of homelessness is is a rotating problem. Uh, we spend money to do outreach, bring people off the streets, help people in who are having uh, health problems, bring them into the hospital, then release them again. Uh, living on the street is no fun. Um, I think we need to look at where other places, ha how other places have dealt with this. Uh, for example, in Utah, uh, they have basically decided that the best way to end homelessness is to provide homes for the people who are living on the street. Um, small, safe living units can be provided cheaper than the endless problems of um, health care, the medical costs. Um, we just need to reach out and help the neediest people in our community. Ms. Eliscana, would you ask your question of Mr. Bedell? In what ways do you think the town of Wallingford has been sustainable, and in what ways do you think it could improve, and what, 
How would you assist in these efforts? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? In what ways do you think the town of Wallingford has been sustainable, and in what ways do you think it could improve? Mm -hmm. How would yeah. you assist these efforts? Yeah, um, I grew up in North Haven, and now I've lived in Wallingford since 2015, and it's really a, a wonderful community. It's, uh, it still has some of the farms and open spaces that I see disappear from the place I grew up in North Haven. Um, so Wallingford has managed to protect these spaces and protect farmers. Uh, we have a thriving both industry, like manufacturing industry, and we have a lot of small, uh, small businesses, service businesses. Um, we have a diverse community with many immigrants who are working in our factories. And I think that Wallingford should continue on this track, uh, welcoming people, promoting small businesses, um, and keeping the economy thriving in this way. Mr. Chicarella. So Wallingford is a great place to live. Um, when I was um, deciding to purchase a house after getting married, I decided between North Haven and Wallingford, and I, I ultimately ended up living in North Haven. But what attracted me to Wallingford, not only the Wallingford Electric um, and the great downtown we have here, um, but it's the process um, of keeping the cost low. And, and Connecticut should take a page out of the playbook of Wallingford and, and surrounding towns like North Haven uh, of keeping the cost of living low. Um, I do think it's important that we invest in certain things that are absolutely needed. Um, but Wallingford does a great job, especially with economic development. We just recently had a retirement of, of um, Tim Ryan, who did a phenomenal job of bringing in businesses that created tax revenue that would allow the town to spend that money for the, for the residents. Uh, and I think that we have to continue to do just that, conserve um, our finances uh, where we can, and, and definitely um, find ways to make Wallingford that much more. Thank you. Ms. Sims, will you ask your question of Mr. Chicarella? Do you agree with the U.S. Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, and do you support the state's safe harbor law? So that, that's a, a very hot topic at a national level. Here in Connecticut, um, women's rights have been codified since the 90s, protecting a woman's choice. And um, I supported legislation this session, um, specifically with the Safe Harbor Law, um, not only because it's about the, the law itself and what the law was designed to do. It, it didn't just talk about abortions. It talked about the access to them. It talked about um, other states telling us in Connecticut how to do business. And, and that's why I strongly supported the Safe Harbor Law. You know, right now we, we have a lot of buzz about Roe versus Wade. And again, it's not affecting Connecticut I don't think there is any worry of a woman's choice here in the state of Connecticut. But, but what I hear when I knock doors, and I've been doing that constantly throughout this campaign trail, I haven't heard that issue once in any of the towns in the district of the 34th. They're worried about public safety. They're worried about the cost of living. And I think it's our job that we find a creative way to address the issues that are, are really addressing our constituents every single day and that's not one of them. I think that it's important that we pay attention to the cost of living and public safety as I've been doing over the last two years while having the privilege of serving the 34th. Uh, and I, I hope that I get the opportunity to continue to focus on those issues that are affecting us right now here in the 34th. Mr. Bedell? Yes. Uh I'm not a constitutional lawyer, so I'm not qualified to say whether the constitutional right to privacy actually protects abortion. Uh, I think ultimately we're going to have to pass a constitutional amendment to protect a woman's right to choose, uh, and I would support that. Here in Connecticut, um, obviously we need to protect not only the women who are here, but women who come here uh, to access abortion legally. Um, 
I served for many years as a justice of the peace. I married same-sex couples before it was legal nationwide, and there was never any thought of um, sending these people back to states where same-sex marriage was illegal and saying that they would have to suffer the consequences there for something they did legally in Connecticut. So yes, I support the safe harbor law. Ms. Deliscano, will you ask your next question of Mr. Bedell? If elected, what are some of the ways that you would support small businesses and, small, and nonprofit organizations? Mm. Um, I think the backbone of our economy is in small businesses. Um, everybody gets excited when a big corporation decides to come and to Connecticut and open up a factory or headquarters. But we see what happens. You know, we had General Electric was here for years, and then it moved to Massachusetts. Um, Bristol Myers Squibb had its headquarters here in Wallingford, uh, and then it decided to pull out. Um, and I think it's much more stable if we invest in small businesses, um, provide small business loans, so that people can uh, start new enterprises. Um, I think the one thing that would really be of um, assistance would be a state public bank like they have in North Dakota that can provide student loans, business loans, it invests in the local economy. It means that all the state treasure, the, the revenues and pension funds are invested in the state economy rather than being sent out to Wall Street. So a state public bank would be of great help uh, and a real emphasis on providing support tax breaks to small businesses, not just the big corporations. Mr. Ciccarella. Thank you. Um, I'm a huge supporter of small businesses and also nonprofits. Um, I have a few small businesses uh, myself, and I understand the challenges that small businesses face uh, every day, along with nonprofits. They do so much with so little for all of our constituents and residents uh, and I think that we need to take a page out of their playbook uh, at the state level and, and realize how they're, they're, they're meeting that challenge of having so little and doing so much good for the community. Um, you know, when it comes to small business and nonprofits, their focus is getting the job done. And they do the best they can what they have here and now. And I understand as a small business owner, when you're trying to do as much as you can um, for your staff, for your, your, your uh, clients, um, you don't want that red tape. I started to talk about that briefly when it comes to. Thank you. Ms. Elascano, will you ask your next, next question to Mr. Mr. Ciccarella? With the suspension of the gas tax and proposals to further extend the suspension, how do you expect to fund current transportation projects? Would you support the implementation of tolls in Connecticut? So I do not support tolls. Um, I think that it is outrageously expensive in Connecticut to live. And ultimately, tolls are just another tax on our already suffering residents of Connecticut. I think we need to find creative ways to reduce our spending so we could move those funds into areas of need, like transportation. Um, you know, I, I every day in business and at my home want more, right? My kids want more, uh, my business needs more, but we have to focus on what absolutely is a necessity. And if something isn't, we have to trim that out. And that money saved could be reallocated somewhere else. And I think that's the same approach we need to take when we think about saying we want to introduce tolls. Um, right now, coming out of the pandemic and, and who knows what direction we're going, another expense for Connecticut residents is not the answer. And, and I'm going to continue to keep that, that ideology uh, until we can find a more creative way that's not going to increase the cost of living for our residents. It's not only gonna be for our residents um, going back and forth to work, but when they get home from work, they're gonna now have to pay more for the goods that they picked up at the grocery store because that same truck that delivered the food to the grocery store is gonna now have to pay that. And at the end of the day, if it's gonna cost businesses more, it's going to end up costing the consumer more, and that's just one more additional tax, and I can't support that. 
Mr. Bedell. Yeah, we need to find ways to save money for our residents here. And yes, it's true, we need to invest in our infrastructure of roads and bridges, but even more so, we need to invest in public transit. Uh, I'm glad that uh, bus fares were waived in the last uh, year or two. Um, we need to continue that, allow, uh, encourage people to take buses and trains by subsidizing the, uh, the cost of that transit. Uh, the more people that we can get and the better service we can provide, the um, less we'll have to depend on gasoline. And gasoline is, obviously we need it now, we're so dependent on cars, but it's not the way of the future. Ms. Sims, will you ask your next question to Mr. Fidel? According to the Sandy Hook Promise, the U.S. has had 2,032 school shootings since 1970. What security measures would you support to make schools safer for Connecticut students? Um, Connecticut has some of the best gun laws in the country, but the problem is it's nationwide. You have the pipeline of guns coming from other states where people can purchase them legally and they're transported into Connecticut. Uh, we've got to reduce the number of guns in this country. Law-abiding citizens should be allowed to have guns, but uh, we have, have to take the guns away from gangsters, criminals, and uh, unfortunately the mentally ill. The, these school shootings are really a social problem. Um, some countries like Canada have almost as much gun ownership, but they don't have the level of violence and hatred in their society. Um, I think it's a question of security. We need to address mental health problems, um, make people feel more secure in their lives, in their communities, um, and not have this division between us and them where, oh, this, this kid, we're not gonna talk with them, and then they end up bringing a gun to school because they don't have any friends. And we need outreach counselors in the schools. Mr. Ciccarello. Thank you. Um, that is a very serious concern. I have two young children. Um, my son is eight, my daughter is gonna be 10. And every day I send my, my children off to school and, and that's a concern. Uh, and I know it's a concern of other parents. Um, in North Haven, um, they decided to increase the amount of school resource officers. I think that's the first step in the right direction. Um, I definitely believe that the, the mental, health, mental health component to some of these tragedies is a huge uh, part of the problem. And we did uh, pass a bill um, that addressed some of the mental health issues, especially with our juveniles. Um, but I think that we have to protect our children um, and I will continue to advocate for uh, more resources, not only for our law enforcement, but for our, for our schools uh, to make sure that that's gonna be achieved. Ms. Elescano, will you ask your next question to Mr. Ciccarella? The government has the responsibility to support education, healthcare, public safety, and other services that are not profit-centered. Do you think that the government should be run more like a business, and how do you see that being possible? So, I think it's important that, that, that you have to kind of dive into that question a little bit deeper. Um, should it be treated like a business? I really do believe it should. Um, but a business, um, the goal is to make money, right? And I think our government should be focused on doing the best they can for their community. I think it needs to be a collaborative approach. Um, you know, if you treat it just like a business, at the end of the day, they're gonna put profit before people. I don't think that's what needs to happen. But I think you need to make decisions as a business owner would. If we say that there are uh, a few programs within the state and they do the same thing, it makes sense that you pull those resources together, reduce the cost, and do the same good for whatever, whatever the, the, the uh, program was doing. All too often, with my time on appropriations, um, I see numerous different um, programs that will do the same thing, and they're funding them. And when I ask simple questions and point out um, the fact that you're gonna be doing the same thing twice. 
why don't we find a way to consolidate, the idea does not get um, a, another consideration, unfortunately. Um, you know, my first term as senator, I I'd say I put forward very few bills. One of the ones that I did was to take a look at where we're spending our money, and if we're wasting it, to reallocate it. And it didn't go too far. And that's common sense that a business would definitely consider uh, in its normal day to day. I do think that we have to do that at the state of Connecticut. Mr. Bedell? Yeah, should the government be run more like a business? Well. Yes, in the sense of striving for efficiency, uh, but anybody who's worked in big business knows that there can be red tape and bureaucracy and inefficiency there too. Um, so I, I'm all for efficiency and smart government. Obviously, it's providing services to uh, people who are um, at risk and are not able to pay. So it's not making profits from these services. Um, so. It really serves a very different function from business. But yes, it can learn some things. Ms. Sims, will you ask your next question to Mr. Bedell? How do you think the state of Connecticut and the town of Wallingford could improve access to public transportation? Mm -hmm. All right, I think we should keep the, uh, the bus fares, make the buses free as they've been the last uh, year or so. Um, we should have more buses running. I'm fortunate to live uh, on a street where a bus stops right across the street from my house. Um, I've not taken advantage of it enough, only a few times, um, but we also have the wonderful train station and increased service on the New Haven to Springfield line. Uh, I've ridden that several times into New Haven or Hartford, um, and we need more trains running there, faster trains. Um, you know, if you look at what other countries have invested in, yes, they have highways, but they've invested in bullet trains, um, sp uh, speedy ways to move people around uh, that also are less polluting, uh, they're more efficient than individuals driving cars on highways. Mr. Ciccarello? Uh, can you ask that question again, please? How do you think the state of Connecticut and the town of Wallingford could improve access to public transportation? So I, I definitely think public transportation is important for a lot of reasons. Um, but we have to make it more accessible. Um, when I proposed free bus fare for veterans while on the Veterans Committee, um, I did a little research and it was quite alarming to see that the, the bus most of the time is more than 50% empty. I think that we have to find a way that we can get people that need these rides um, better access, um, whether that's through technology, if it's an application. Um, without this um, transportation, it's hard to get people to work and we have to find a way to, to cut that um, barrier, and I think by increasing the amount of, again, technology when we talk about businesses, I think that's a step in the right direction. Um, we have a lot of infrastructure money coming to Connecticut, and I think that, that we could leverage yeah. that to kind of um, increase. You. Ms. Sims, will you ask your next question to Mr. Ciccarella? How would you support the LGBTQ plus community you serve? Uh, the same way I'll support all of the community. Um, I listen to the issues that are um, in front of people and find a common sense solution to fix them. Um, I don't think it's any um, different than an issue that anyone else or in any other profession would face. Um, but I think it's, it's listening to the problem and coming up with a common sense solution to address it. Mr. Bedell? Yes, uh, sexual and gender minorities have been uh, historically one of the most oppressed groups in this country. And uh, they suffer from persecution, uh, rejection by families, by peers, by communities. We've come a long way with uh, 
legalizing same-sex marriage. Uh, I married so many same-sex couples as a justice of the peace, and they were so joyful to be finally recognized, um, to have their lives legitimized by that. But nowadays, I think the greatest risk is among trans people. Um, there's a lot of suicide, there's um, sexual abuse of trans people. Uh, we need uh, support for them, we need public education. Um, we need to stop treating these people like outsiders and rejects. Ms. Eliscano, will you ask your next question to Mr. Bedell? Every day, about 32 people in the United States die in drunk driving crashes. That's one person every 45 minutes, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. What steps do you think that the legislator should take as a response? Well, long term, we need to move away from these personal automobiles and have more better public transit so that people don't have to get in a car and drive while they're uh, under the influence. But uh, in the short term, we need to enforce um, drinking laws. Uh, it may involve um, at bars and places that, that serve alcohol, um, perhaps they provide their own shuttle services instead of having parking lots full of cars and they know what's gonna happen when their patrons go out and get back in their cars. Uh, when it does happen, then people need to have their licenses revoked. Uh, they need to go into a, um, a rehab program. But I'd like to see a lot more prevention. Mr. Ciccarella. Thank you. That's a sad statistic to hear. Um, it's quite alarming. Um, ultimately, um, the substance abuse is uh, not getting better. Um, coming out of the pandemic, we, we know that dependency issues are increasing, and I'm sure that that does not help the statistics that you just said. Um, you know, simply put, there, there does have to be consequences for the actions. Um, we have to make sure that we're giving our officers the tools um, that they need to make sure people are not um, under the influence. Um, you know, right now with, with legalizing marijuana, um, there's no proper way to, to properly roadside test someone to see if they're under the influence of certain type of drugs like marijuana. And I think that supporting our law enforcement is definitely a step in that right direction and also addressing mental health issues, which sometimes may lead to dependency issues in alcohol and drug abuse. Ms. Sims, will you ask your next question to Mr. Ciccarella? Anyone who pulls up to a gas pump or takes a trip to the grocery store has seen the rise, the cost of fuel and consumer goods and food increase tremendously throughout 2022. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics and its Consumer Price Index report in September stated area prices are generally up 7.2% in the Northeast region. If elected, what actions would you take to address inflation and reduce the cost of energy, groceries, and other consumer goods and services for Connecticut residents? So that is a big problem that I hear from a lot of the constituents when I knock on the doors um, and have great conversations. Um, unfortunately, uh, again, that's a big problem that doesn't just affect Connecticut, and a lot of the decisions made at a national level trickle down to Connecticut and other states um, that are clearly increasing the cost of living. Um, and unfortunately, at a state level, there's not too many decisions that we could make um, that could directly um, stop that larger problem. Um, but we could ease the pain um, like we did when we proposed reducing um, the gas tax or, or suspending um, certain taxes. But that's a, a small um, Band-Aid on a large problem. We don't know how long that's going to last. Um, again, reducing cost and reallocating money um, um, to areas that would ultimately give some relief to, to families that are just having a hard time getting by. Um, when we talked about the gas tax, when we talked about 
all of the other costs that, that our families um, um, are having um, to bear with that, that just outrageous cost of living, holes are not going to be a solution in that right direction. Adding more taxes is not going to be able to kind of alleviate some of that. What we need to do is find a way to decrease the cost of living. And any type of attack just simply is not uh, going to be that approach. But we did, at, at the Senate level, um, come up with a better way of reducing the taxes. And if I had more than 10 more seconds, I'd love to start to dive into some of those things. But you could go to the website and, and see what we did and what we can plan to do in the future to alleviate some of that uh, burden on our, our residents. Mr. Bedell? Yeah, there are a lot of factors influencing the... Uh, inflation that's currently going on um, but I think what we need to do for basic staples is support um, reliance on a local economy because one big factor in the inflation is the cost of fuel and transport of you know, food from California or um, or even from other countries uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to pay my grocery bill up front in the spring by buying a share at a local farm. And then I got my groceries all through the summer. Uh, just last week, I got the last uh, share, big basket of produce from the farm. I think we need to promote that kind of local farm to table economy so that uh, people can rely on local staples rather than having to buy expensive things from out of state. Ms. Elascano, will you ask your next question to Mr. Bedell? The COVID-19 pandemic has taken a toll on the mental health of many of our children and youth. In Connecticut, according to the CDC, suicide is the second leading cause of death among people ages 10 to 34, and the state overall ranks 11th in the nation. What measures do you propose to help address the situation? Um. A friend of mine just checked into the psychiatric emergency room last night. Um, and I saw what he, this was like the third time he went into an emergency room in the last month. Um, and I saw what he was going through, trying to get treatment, um, having to wait you know, days for an appointment with his uh, providers, uh, and being afraid to enter hospital because of his experience there in the past, um, suffering from terrible insomnia. Uh, we need better mental health care, uh, better health care in general, uh, so that people are not stuck and falling through the cracks. Uh, you know, my friend was talking about suicide several times because he just didn't see another alternative. Um, you know, we need doctors and social workers to be there for our most at-risk people in society, youth and, and older adults. Mr. Ciccarella? Mental health is definitely a very large problem um, that is only increasing, um, whether it was compounded from COVID um, and it was definitely on our radar this session. And we paid a lot of attention to legislation that addressed some of the mental health issues. Um, and, and I think that we need to continue to do that. I, we talk about a lot of things um, today, you know, gun violence, um, dependency issues. And I think mental health is really at the base of some of those issues. Um, and I think that we have to continue to find um, better ways to get access and treatment. And I think that we are walking in that right direction, um, but we have to continue um, you know, that conversation and get rid of the stigma of, of people getting um, treatment and help. Um, and um, I look forward um, to hopefully getting to continue to do that and be a part of that conversation. Um, that is a huge problem here in Connecticut. Ms. Elascano, will you ask your next question to Mr. Ciccarella? Do you support efforts to promote diversity and inclusion in the classroom through initiatives like how the state mandated elective black and Latino studies? You ask the question again? Do you support efforts to promote diversity and inclusion in the classroom through initiatives like the state mandated 
elective Black and Latino studies? Sure, absolutely. Um, inclusion's important. Um, we talked about bullying that may be a trigger of certain types of school violence. Um, you know, I raise my, my children um, to judge people on how they're treated. Um, if people are kind, it doesn't matter um, what your religion, color, gender, um, that's how I raise my children. Um, and I think that inclusion is, is um, very important, um, maybe to even decrease some of the mental health issues um, that, that children um, may have. Somebody doesn't, um, you know, um, feel included, it definitely could, could feel as if you're, you're all alone. Um, you know, it, it's something that needs to be um, at, the, at the front of, of, of mind and find ways that children and everyone are comfortable in their day-to-day -day life. Um, the black and Hispanic studies, for the most part, I think is, is great curriculum. Um, I think that um, history is important and everyone should have a good understanding um, what has happened and, and issues that people may face or have faced. Um, but I think we have to pay attention to um, all of the literature um, and parts of the curriculum um, that get brought in front of our children. Um, in my time at the Senate, um, there's different types of, of curriculum that get proposed, and, and sometimes I think that a kindergartner may not um, be exposed to certain things. Um, and we have to pay attention to what our children are, are digesting um, when it comes to um, education. And it's very important that the parents are, are aware of what they're learning. Um, so I want to make sure that inclusion is top of mind, but most importantly, Thank you. a parental's understanding of what the children are dealing with. Mr. Bedell? Yeah, it's, it's very important for children to have role models that they can identify with. And they need to see their themselves validated um, in the school curriculum. They need to see their, uh, their faith, their race, their uh, cultural heritage, their families represented and validated um, so that they can aspire to being part of the general community and not feel left out. So yes, I would support all efforts to broaden the curriculum to provide many points of view uh, many models of, um, of behavior and um, functioning members of society that children can look up to. Ms. Sims, will you ask the next question to Mr. Bedell? The National School Board's Association cites studies set show that all students benefit when they have access to teachers of color, especially black and Latino children. To what extent should local school districts focus their efforts on recruiting a diverse educator workforce? Yeah, well, this fits with the previous question about curriculum. Uh, not only seeing role models on paper, but also um, in the, the adults that are um, in the schools and in their lives. Um, I think children would benefit greatly from seeing a diverse uh, staff in the schools. And as you said, children of all races, it's not just seeing yourself reflected, but seeing your neighbors there, seeing your, your friends, um, and realizing that, yes, we can all live and, and work together and appreciate and, um, and affirm each other, including our recognizing our differences, as well as our, what we share in common. Mr. Ciccarella? So I, I completely um, believe that diversity is important in, in all professions, not just education. Um, multiple point of view, views, perspectives, backgrounds, um, really um, allow for a whole picture of what, what's, what's out there in the world. And I don't think that um, there should just be one type of, again, race, religion, gender um, pushed on to our students. And I think that we do a really good job of diversity here in the 34th district. Um, uh, and I look forward to continuing that. Ms. Elascano, will you ask the next question to Mr. Ciccarella? 
To what extent do you support the state police accountability law that was passed in 2020? So sometimes legislation um, has great um, attendant consequences, um, but all the time there's unattended consequences. And I think with the police accountability bill, we're seeing that. Um, crime is up. Enrollment in new recruit for officers is down. And that is a huge problem. I am not a supporter of the police accountability bill um, for a lot of reasons. Um, is there good parts to the bill? I'm sure there's good things to the bill. Does there need to be accountability for someone's actions? Absolutely. Um, but I think that bill went too far, and I think that our residents are going to feel the consequences of that legislation, and I think it needs to be addressed sooner than later. Mr. Bedell? Yes. Um, I'm not going to speak directly to the contents of the bill, because I, I know there have been some um, unforeseen consequences, and I don't know if it was caused by the language of the bill or how it was implemented. But yes, we need accountability. Um, for all people who serve the public. Um, there should not be an exception made for police officers. Uh, at the same time, um, I did not agree with the slogan to defund the police. I don't agree with most slogans, usually to get it wrong, too simplified. But I do think that we needed to uh, put more money into uh, social workers who can um, serve in some of the capacities where we were sending police officers in who were uh, you know, not prepared. It's not what they were trained for to deal with a, a mental breakdown. Um, and you know, too often we've called on the police officers first when another service worker might be a um, better, better person to serve the function. Ms. Sims, will you ask the last question of Mr. Bedell? Recently, Governor Ned Lamont announced that in collaboration with the CT Office of Early Childhood and the United Way of Connecticut, that child care workers will be receiving a pay bonus as a way to show gratitude for their work. How else do you think the government could support child care workers at this time? Hmm. Yeah, investment in child care, uh, early childhood education and just daycare for working parents is so important. Um, for the future of our country um, and also for the economy, you know, to make it feasible for, um, for parents to have careers and jobs. Um, so if we can provide support for um, uh, businesses to have daycare on the premises would be a lot more convenient than racing around trying to drop off your kid, pick up your kid uh, at different times of day. Uh, it might involve uh, some kind of um, voucher system where uh, parents could then use the vouchers to pay for, for daycare. Um, and, uh, uh, and also better uh, training for daycare workers. I think we should fund programs that provide good training. Mr. Chikarella? Thank you. Um, I think it's important that we pay attention um, to the great work that our child care uh, providers um, do every day for the future generations uh, you know, of, of, of our district. Um, and I think uh, this bonus, which is one time, is a great, great idea. Um, I think that um, we have to find a way to continue to incentivize good, solid um, role models to be around our, our children. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to finding ways that we can do that. Um, but, but a one-time bonus, I don't think, is the answer to that. Um, and I look forward to, to finding some additional solutions. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the question and answer portion of the program. Each candidate will now have three minutes to make a closing statement. Mr. Ciccarello, will you begin, please? Thank you, and thank you for putting this on. I think it was great that we um, had an opportunity to come here and, and have our voices heard so the constituents could, could hear what we had to say. Um, and thank you, uh, Dave, for coming out as well. Um, you know, I'm a uh, 
a father, a husband, I'm a small business guy, um, I'm retired law enforcement, um, I'm an everyday guy. Um, I think by having that perspective up in Harvard does a great deal of um, good for our constituents. I, I think that I could get their, their message across um, to everyone. Um, my time, the last two years for the Capitol, um, I, I have pride that I get along with everybody. I'm able to have conversations with everyone. And that allows me to, to take the word of all of the constituents that I hear, whether it's at the grocery store or knocking on the doors, to the table to try to get their voices heard. Um, and, and what I'm gonna try to focus on this session um, is just that, the problems that I'm hearing. Crime is a problem. The cost of living is a problem. People are concerned, and I think that my life experience in my small business my own investigation firm, and we do a lot of different things, but basically what we do is solve problems. Um, and those problems could be with you know, why a business is losing money to um, you know, um, why something went missing. Um, and I think with that skill set, I could do a great job of finding out solutions to the problems that we have and, and coming up with common sense, affordable plans to address those. I hope that I could count on everyone's support on November 8th, and I'd like to thank everybody for participating in, in today's debate. Mr. Bedell. Oh, yes, thank you everyone for participating tonight. Um, I think I'd like to stress that the role the state can play in serving the needs of the neediest people in our society. Uh, we need to continue providing education for our children we need to pr provide health care for our elderly. Uh, we need to address the needs of people with physical disabilities and psychiatric disabilities, um, people in, uh, with mental health issues. Um, these are the people that need our focus in order to bring up the whole quality, the quality of life for everyone in our state. Um, there are a lot of quality of life issues that I think about um, when I was out petitioning to get on the ballot. I talked to a lot of people and you know, they complained about things like the, the noise levels uh, where they lived, the uh, you know, noisy engines, um, highways, leaf blowers. Uh, they talked about the um, pollution down in, in East Haven. People are up in arms about the expansion of Tweed Airport, which is just ruining the quality of life for people living around there. Uh, we need to put an emphasis on protecting our water resources. We need clean air, we need clean water, um, and we need cleaner sources of energy because the planet is going into a climate crisis. And I know it's not everybody's immediate concern, but you know, we all hear about the extreme weather events. Um, we know about the, um, the extinctions that are going on or just the, the decline of wildlife. Um, I believe in the last few decades, the number, total number of animals of all species has gone down over 50%. Um, insect populations are plummeting, and when that happens, the bird populations plummet, all of the wildlife goes down, and this is the whole ecological system that we depend on. Uh, so we really need to focus on that and protect our environment, uh, make our streets safe, uh, need a uh, better place for um, everyone who lives here, plants, animals, and people. Thank you. This concludes the Senate 34th District segment of the 2022 Candidates Forum. On behalf of the Wallingford community women, I thank you for watching and remind you to vote on November 8th.